All right, we are back here for Inside Futsal episode number five. We got a very, very super special guest out here. One of my favorite journalists in the entire game, hands down worldwide, covering stuff. I know she's so humble already. She does the five by four futsal podcasts. She does one of the best interview series and information sites, futsal00.pt. You have to follow them. You have to follow her. Welcome to the show, Paula Ferreira Lobo. How are you doing, my friend? Hi, Chris. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words introducing me. And thank you for having me on the show. So I think this is going to be great and I hope people enjoy it. So And give their comments back to us when, whenever this is airing. Absolutely. We'll put it on in a couple hours out there and uh, hopefully the video rendering process can be a little bit smoother. <laughs> I want to have a better design, but uh, I got to be honest, today was a really interesting uh, series of games in Group A. Uh, I, I guess let's just jump off right into it. I mean, we had Serbia versus Ukraine. Um, were you expecting the Ukraine to beat Serbia 6-1 to one when you woke up today? I think no one was expecting that. Not even Ukrainians <laughs> Not were expecting to, to. They may be expecting to win, but not by this this difference in the in the final score. No, not at all. And it, what surprised me was, um, well, I think Serbia. Um, we have to be fair. Serbia is. There's one Serbia with Lazarevic and another Serbia without Lazarevic. And this this is important. They lost against Portugal. I think they would have lost anyway, <laughs> obviously. I'm not just saying this because I'm Portuguese, because I really think uh, we are one of the top contenders to win the title again. Uh, but as we saw in the World Cup, Lazarevic was the, the, the guy who who did the most damage to the Portuguese defense. He scored two goals. And I think they they are not, um, they haven't been able to deal with his absence. They were working with the perspective of having him on this match, at least it's what's been on the news in the in the UEFA website, but they haven't. And I think they can, they just are not adjusting their game to what they really have um, now. And I think, you, the Ukrainians, despite the fact that they they just had ten players, two goalkeepers and eight players to to be on the pitch, uh, they were super focused, which they were lacking when they were they played against the Netherlands. That's why they lost. But this time they were super focused and they brought on all their experience because they've been in the knockout runs for like years and years i can't even remember the last time they didn't make through the stage group and i think that was key they were super focused they managed to score first and then they just said okay we are going to do our thing our way you get the ball here we are and on the counter back we are going to literally kill you and they did six times it was at some point it started to be painful to watch it hurt for sure, and it was yeah. a completely different contrast when yeah. they played each other in the quarterfinals at Euro 2016, and yeah. uh, I think it was Simic that scored that winning goal out there. Uh, but to come back and see it was just, uh, you know, one goal after another. That My favorite one was uh, when they went up 5-0, and it was the total yeah. team passing. It was just a futsal clinic. I, I felt bad for, you know, Stefan Rakic and, and some of the others that just couldn't stop this, uh, you know, Ukrainian team that – was a completely different night and day from match day one. And so you mentioned, too, that the, uh, the, the Ukrainian team also had reduced players, and I think it was they were down four or five players, um, and it was just really interesting to hear your perspective of how much more focused they were, the guys are getting their minutes and getting their time. Um, and you know what? That looked like one of the Ukrainian teams of old from, from the old uh, early uh, last decade and, and beyond. So it's uh, you know a nice resurgence and definitely sets up uh, a great final match with uh, Portugal. Yes, although, and again, not because I'm Portuguese, but they are going to face a whole lot of a lot other challenge and way harder challenge because um, Ukrainians do a lot of play a lot with people with pivot, right? And Portugal has one of 
three of the best <laughs> defenders in the game. I mean, Eric was just um, voted the fifth best player in the world, and we saw him defending Fran, defending P2 on the last um, UEFA Champions League, and we can you can be sure that he will be taking care of, of those guys in Ukraine, and they will uh, note that it's way harder to pass Eric, to pass Tomás Passó, to pass João Matos, to pass André Coelho, than it was to pass for the guys in Serbia, especially because Portugal has one thing they've been work we've been working our mentality so even when the team is losing as they were with serbia they hardly get their focus off so they react really well even when they are in disadvantage and i think that's what happened with serbia they started losing and trying to do things well real quick they made mistakes and Ukraine, the Ukrainians punished them. I don't think that will happen with Portugal. Even if they score first, Portugal will always keep their cool to come back to the to the game. And that's going to be key, I think. I think that's key to to every uh, Portugal, Portugal Portuguese con conquest in the last few years. I mean, we are not defending champions in this Euro and world champions by accident it, it wasn't it wasn't an accident we, we may discuss that other teams may have a most attractive way of playing but portugal gets results and we are really good at defending so i don't believe the ukrainians are going to be that lucky as they were today because at some point i at least for me uh everything went wrong for serbia they they didn't even have any luck they have a few balls that could that could have ended in in goal and it it, it goes way up or that, it was just they lost their focus and the ukrainians and very well took advantage of them because they need the goal average too it's that is important it's a, one of the criteria but i don't really believe they have arguments to to beat portugal I yeah I have to agree with you. And after watching the Portugal versus Netherlands game, um, I'm going to be interested to see how Serbia respond because we do have an opportunity to see a three-way tie for that second place. But unfortunately yeah. now, Serbia uh, coming in with a negative goal difference. Uh, I think, uh, what are they at now? It's going to be minus, minus seven coming in? Or six plus four, ten. They suffered four goals from Portugal. And now six, so ten goals, and they scored three, so yeah, seven. Yeah, it's it's something it's, else. So it's a lot. I don't think they're going to be able to do it against the Dutch team. And no, I mean, probably yeah. not. How great was it though, at least to see the Netherlands win their opening game? Um, you know, that was uh, you know impressive for me to you know see. It's just unfortunate that there's no fans in the arena because uh, I know how much work the Dutch Federation and all of their employees. Uh, did in making in, in making this this tournament look so attractive on TV. I love it. Uh, I just wish that there was fans out there to really see them enjoy that first win. And you know, now that uh, you know they played Portugal today, that would have been a, a complete sellout for sure. I think they were on track for a sellout for the match. And um, ultimately, you know, with this Portugal game today, uh, let's uh, let's talk right about it. You know, first uh, first things first. Edu is back. Missed the World Cup. Baby comes back, yeah. gets injured. What's going on? And Andre Sousa starts out there. T talk to us about the the futsal uh, the futsal goalkeeper situation on the Portuguese team. Well, I haven't asked this to our uh, head coach, but I can assure you that if it was his choice, this wouldn't be happening because <laughs> no one, no no coach wants this this um, kind of uncertainty uh, when preparing for such an, an important tournament uh bebe was out of the um, the squad uh i i really don't don't know why and george Bras, ask, yeah. but no but george Bras doesn't really like questions that um about that uh the thing he said when he was presenting the squad uh he said that these are the 14, but they could be 
a lot more. And it's not in, just in the goalkeepers. There's a lot of players that could have been there. And Portugal would still be a strong um, squad no matter what. So he will... I don't know what his criteria were. Uh, seeing Portuguese playing now, maybe, is because uh, André Souza plays better with their, his feet. He, he can go up in the in in the pitch and do and, and do that and Bebe can't he doesn't he doesn't have those those characteristics so maybe i'm assuming and and really it's important to to highlight this i'm just commenting and giving my opinion because again george brash has not have made an official comment on this issue and i don't think he will ever <laughs> made made a comment he, he chose those those 14. The thing was, after uh, the second preparation game, both André Coelho and Edu tested positive to COVID-19, which for Edu is amazing. He tested positive four months ago at the beginning of the World Cup and now four months later at the beginning of the Euro. That must have been hard. But the thing is, we had the this game plan and... George Brash usually has this plan and he has a plan B, but the idea is always the same. So uh, some people, even here in Portugal, uh, defended that maybe he should have cut loose one of the, um, the other players and secure uh, Edu's uh, place. But that will probably uh, destroy a bit of that team spirit that they are always advocating as the key to win and we actually can see we have uh, i think it was eric uh, it was eric definitely <laughs> eric um he shared on his instagram like in december i think uh some inside footage of the world cup and you see that they are real friends they have fun together and that is important uh, throughout the whole the whole process so george brash would never do that would never cut loose a, a player just to for the sake of the other now bebe got injured which is unfortunate but obviously he said okay let's let's bring edu edu back and and go with edu which for portugal in my opinion um it's it's a good news and it's not because of bebe because if it was me i would have bring edu and bebe and not andre souza um but i think edu is one of the top goalkeepers in the in the world i mean uh who everyone uh, that follows the spanish league knows how good he is so for portugal is important to to have um, a goalkeeper with that level and especially because he's ju he's just so young he's 25 years old so um, i think it's important it was a bit of poetic justice um, it was unfortunate to be at bebe's expenses but it was a bit poetic justice edu deserved to be there and i i expect I really expect to see him to see him playing, if not a full game, full game next one, the, at least um, half half game. George Brash sometimes does does that. Yeah, I remember at the World Cup, I was World talking Cup, to George yeah. after the it was after the semifinal because we went to uh, penalties uh, against Kazakhstan, and uh, we'd seen uh, a switch uh, in the round before. And I talked to George about the you know the confidence in his goalkeepers, and he was saying he's like. We don't just have three good goalkeepers in Portugal. We have four, and it's the most difficult decision for a coach to to have to you know cut one from this extended roster here at the World Cup, and especially with COVID. And to have, um, the, he says he has them training together so that they build their kind of own uh, foundation, their own group, and that they're very you know good together, but also very competitive to help each other move up. And to see Edu miss the last World Cup because of COVID, it was just you know super disappointing. But this one was just like two times in four months. This poor guy, you know, who's, as you said, an elite goalkeeper uh, in the stage out there. Uh, it's unbelievable that he missed. But, you know, the term poetic justice, I don't think really could be beat. So it's good to see him back. Uh, hopefully, Bebe's injury doesn't affect him too much. It's, uh, I think, a lower right calf injury. Uh, so 
it'll probably be something in about maybe a couple of weeks it will heal properly and he'll get back to what he does best but um i'm i'm on the uh, the side of your fence where i think uh, edu is probably uh, the number one goalkeeper in Portugal. That's just how I feel about it. Um, and I think Portugal are, you know, going to get better. I hope that his lungs and everything are good. I'm sure they are. Otherwise, George would not have called him yeah, back. Yeah, of course. But, uh, you know, you talked about uh, Andre Souza's ability uh, to leap the court. And we saw that uh, they, they got mistaken for it. He got caught out of his net today and, and paid the price <laughs> on it. So his one rare mistake out there, it was uh, something else to see that shot hit the crossbar and then the rebound comes and uh, defender wasn't barking out there. Uh, what did you think of uh, Andre's performance in that today? Uh, first of all, um, that he was he, he was up obviously, but it, that wasn't just his fault because if you if you watch the um, the the full the full game and you watch that particular moment, you will see that he didn't have the support of his colleagues because the other players didn't just came <laughs> came to defense to to prevent. Uh, I can't remember. It was Bulzambu? No. I can't remember. Boyans, I can't say. I'd have to go watch the clip again. No, it's the number 11. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can I can't pronounce the name. It's number 11, the player number 11 from the Netherlands. Um, he he could just advance to to the goal without any opposition other than Andres. So and I I actually I went to the press conference, online press conference. And I asked George Braz about about that, and he recognized that Portugal cannot um, allow goals like that. Uh, but he also pointed out that we, the rest of the team, didn't get back to to help Andres. So it was a, a collective <laughs> and a team's mistake, not just um, an Andres um, mistake. But yeah, uh, as I as you put it, uh, Andre. Has, gives um, George Braz that option, and you will most definitely see more of that in the upcoming years in Portugal. Not probably not with Andres also because he's 35 years old now. Uh, but we have a young uh, goalkeeper in Sporting. It's actually the twin brother of number three, Tomás Passó. His young, his twin brother Bernardo Passó is a goalkeeper from Sporting. Is learning with Gita, so you know he has the best the best teacher like ever, and he also he has the same game style as Gita and is learning from him. We've been seeing and when Gita got injured in the elite round from UEFA Champions League, uh, Bernardo was the one who assumed the role his role for five to six games. And he was he was good. He's he's getting good. So he will probably be the second um, goalkeeper from Portugal with Edu and Bernardo, two different so different goalkeepers. So yeah, Portugal is not getting any any weaker with the game. So everyone else is going to step up their game because that's what we are doing here in Portugal. Well, I mean, it was evident that. The, you know, George even said that the tournament I asked him and he said, I asked him what the real secret was for this new growth and consistent success. And he says that we always have a generation of young players coming up and we cycle them in all the time out there to mix so we don't lose a beat. And European champions, world champions, uh, and they look very heavily favored to uh, go to the final this time around out there. You can't uh, dispute the results that uh, him and the rest of the team have put together. I mean, we saw it even today. Obviously, there's a difference with the Netherlands and Portugal in terms of class, um, but the Netherlands, with more investment, will become uh, a more uh, powerful uh, opponent in years to come over in UEFA competitions. But it was evident that Portugal completely dominated, uh, especially through the first half. You felt like any pass that they made was almost a guarantee, that the ball was a magnet on the foot of the Portuguese players. <laughs> it was amazing, and, and even to see just a light pass with... Uh, you know, Pani's uh, first goal where, you know, he rolled the ball and quick toe poke in the near post. It was just magnificent. Um, can anybody stop this Ziki pani combination? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, that's what I was going to say. I, I don't think so either. They, cause they, they play in sporting together. Um, and Ziki has actually been playing for sporting for years and years now i think he got there with 11 he's 21 now so 10 years and that's actually the the success 
of Portuguese Portuguese futsal because everyone from the federation to every club started to work with really young people, attracting more and more young boys, more boys than girls. We will be able to talk about that later on this on this conversation. But they started everyone started to to invest in football from a young age. So now players like Ziki, like Tomas Passo, uh, like Afonso, are reaching the this these stages with a lot and lot of games, with a lot of lot of experience. So this was the the secret that allowed us to to be more close to Spain, which we've been we've beat in the final of the last Euro and we, we beat last quarterfinals in the World Cup. And this is the key. And because not only the, the clubs, but also the Federation has become more interested in futsal and investing more and gathering these young generations in a lot of comp competitives, in a lot of competitions. We have competition for like since 13, 14 years old, they are competing for national tournaments. They have the um, our national teams younger and younger, and they are giving them all the infrastructural support and staff support they need. And this is allowing all the players to grow up so good as Ziki and Tomas. Obviously, um, Ziki is unbelievable. <laughs> that guy is... Even have you ever uh, you've been in Lithuania, right, for the World Cup? Oh yeah, it was he was he's so, such a humble young kid too to talk to. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you saw him. You've been face to face with him, so he's super, <laughs> super tall. My my neck and... is still hurting from how high my head had to go up <laughs> yeah. to interview him. Yeah, obviously you you have to the his physical characteristics are enhanced by this, but the fact that there's so much investment and good investment in futsal. He's the absolute key about this because, and you see in the preparation, you could, you could compare Portugal was one of the first teams to start the preparation to, to this Euro as it was in the world cup. Uh, we played against the Netherlands in the Netherlands in last November they were trying out hotels. They were trying out uh, routes to go from Amsterdam to Groningen to get the players adapt to that. And at this level of the competition, when futsal, fortunately, is more widely spread and there's a lot of quality players in every, every uh, national team here, we see a lot of stars and a lot of guys doing incredible things details are going to matter more and more and at this point details are um allowing portugal to enhance its quality because there's a supporting staff um allowing players to focus just on winning and they are delivering absolutely fantastic on that i mean who was the most impressive player for you today in Portugal? I elected Ziki as man of the match. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> no surprise. I thought about Pani too, because he scored two goals. He was, in, he was important. But I mean, Portugal unblocked the game with Ziki on it. He was the, the first Portuguese player to m messed up the so well-organized defense of the Netherlands. And there was a game when he was on the pitch and when he was off the pitch. And even though and the, the Max, the head coach of the Netherlands, on the press conference after the game said, they were prepared to try and deal with Pani and Ziki and everything. They, they, they just couldn't. They, they did what they could, but they are a, a, another level of players. And that there's no... This is not... Uh, how can I say this? I, I don't want to be rude to anybody and everything. Speak Obviously. freely. This is a free show. There's no, no cancel but, culture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, it's it's the truth. I mean, he, the guy was just elected the best young player in the world. And it's really hard to, to stop him. He was the absolute key 
in the Portugal game as he had been in the, the game against Serbia. It was the same thing. It was only with him on the pitch that we managed to unblock that so so well organized defense. It's important to have a player like Ziki because even though he doesn't score like he didn't, he helps to open up spaces to others to score. And when you have strikers like Pani, everything gets easier. So we, we have uh, uh, 14, George Brash used to say, we have 14 quality players. We could have been with other 14 quality players in Portugal. And that is true. But when you have the second best player in the world, which is probably should have been the first, but let's not get into it. No, I was going to ask on that. I don't want to get away from it because I actually <laughs> okay. have a vote for the Futsal Awards and I put Pani as my number one out there. And uh, so I, I, everyone I speak with out there, I ask them, who was number one uh, in your mind and who was number two? So I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Pani is number one as well in your books? Um, let me just say one thing. I'm going to take advantage of this, <laughs> of this moment you gave me to say one thing. Please. First thing about that, um, those voters and those awards are that 91 people voted. 91 people, 91 men. Zero women voted to that election. Just something to think about. It's 2022 and zero, zero women voted to those awards. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to listen to you more, but I am going to be making a mention to Luca because we do need more females out there. And he's very pro-female, as we saw that seven of the, or six or seven of the awards are for female futsal, whether it's coach of the year, club coach. Yeah, but then things. you don't have any women who who actually are the ones who follow more female female futsal voting. I was surprised you. that you didn't have a vote. I was very surprised, actually, because I go down the list. <laughs> no, I want to see. I'm like, you know, all right, which of my friends didn't vote for Pani? Which which of them voted for uh, <laughs> someone else besides Ziki or someone else? I, I it, was I, I did that, too. <laughs> <laughs> What did you think of my picks? Did you go through my picks? Yes, I did. I, I actually, uh, uh, there was one point that I, I actually go to every uh, one of the 91 um, voters. And you're a savage. You're, you're even more hardcore than, than, than me. Jeez. <laughs> no, but good. I'm going to explain the explain why. Because uh, some of the, um, the results uh, surprised me. And the election of Raum was one of them. Uh, so I just went to, to check uh, where did this all go wrong? Because to me, the there's only one discussion. It was either Pani or Merlin. I mean, don't get me wrong. Ferran is one hell of a player. He's really, really good. We are really lucky to be able to watch him play. But this is a yearly award. Is supposed to reward the best player on that year. And I'm sorry, it was not Fran. It wasn't. The guy lost the champ the final champions to Sporting. And the guy was Brazil was third in the World Cup. Portugal won the World Cup. So even if you want to punish Merlin because Italy does did not qualify to the World Cup, you, you don't want to vote for Merlin, you have to vote for Pani. There's no way around it. Fram for me was inexplicable. But again, hell of a player, but he didn't deserve that that award the, this year. It was Pani or Merlin. And obviously, um, as a Portuguese, I would be happy to if it was Pani, but if it was um, Merlin, I would agree also because he's a hell of a player and I watch him play every <laughs> Every every week, so it's is uh, really important. He was actually voted one uh, for another award. Some awards we have here. We elected Gita. We at zero zero point pt. Uh, we did an internal vote. We elected Gita the best player um, of the season. Uh, but there was a competitor website that called up um, uh, team's captain and team's uh, coaches, and they elected Merlin because they know how hard it is to, to stop Merlin, really. Uh, which is um, another interesting point for the... And, uh, and, 
do you know the Italian um, coach? Can you ask him why he didn't bring Cavinato in? I mean, does he watch Sporting? Does he know how much goal the Merlin Cavinato uh, are worth? It's like it's even more than Pani and Ziki. Trust me, way more. Which is another. I'm sorry. I'm going. Like, I'm no, going no, off it's... topic here, but I just. I just remember. And I'm not. I'm not even a Cavinato big fan. I. Th I think he's a useful player, but uh, I don't think he's a top player. Okay, uh, he's useful. He scores a lot of goals. Um, I don't think he's a top player because whenever Sporting is playing against Benfica, for example. He is never a player that makes a difference, like Merlin. Merlin always makes a difference on the important games. And I think that's why Merlin also deserved to be voted number one. And he almost lost his third place, because if you saw the, the difference, he almost lost to Pitu, which is was super surprising. And again, Pani was almost 100 points down to Ferran, which is, makes no sense. I think there's a point of it where no, it's people recognize the the star brand names, and I and I've, I've said in every single episode I've been saying for a decade, one thing futsal needs to do is build all of its superstars and not just put its eggs into one basket. We did this with Falcao, we did this with Ricardinho, and now Ziki's coming up out there. Fahao, Leozinho from Brazil, you know the kid has a, has an attitude and a great game, but there's so many great players out there that nobody really knows about. And for me, I'm certainly, uh, you know, not a, an expert. I'm always going to be considered myself a student of the sport and always going to be making mistakes, but hopefully less and less as the years go by. And part of that is watching as many highlights and games and, and having people promoted as much as possible. So when you see someone like Alex, who, you know, doesn't necessarily get the international stage, um, you know, I think people are watching World Cups and they're saying, OK, these are the best in the world. Why aren't these players here? And I think a lot of it with Fahal winning the third one, to be honest, and, and I got a I got a lot of stuff from my friends in Brazil. I didn't put them in my top five. Yeah. Like people that, were, yeah. I, so, as, as I said, I go, uh, I went through the all 91 voters and I can tell you when was the difference. It was in the Spanish voters. Yeah. And it's it, the thing is, he's the Coca-Cola now of, of, of football. He's a three time <laughs> yeah. award winner. And then Genie is the same thing. Um, and it's going to be interesting because if you ask, you know, a lot of the, the, the people in the world, you know, name another female football player in the world. A lot of them can't. You know, For me, mean? it was for me, Becky deserved the award. Uh, she had a phenomenal year out there. So, I mean, it was it's not going to be a negative. But now we're going to see what happens with a full season in Spain for a Manginia, you know, what, what's really going to happen because there's dominance in Brazil. And I think she has what eight awards and she's only 26. It's, it's insane. There's nothing like yeah. it I've ever seen, you know, Messi, Ronaldo, no one has this. Um, and it's good because number one, this girl should be getting a million dollars. She should be the face of futsal with these awards. She's very humble, very friendly in interviews. And I mean, I, my broken Portuguese, I try to pick up all the little stuff <laughs> I can. And uh, hopefully I, I get to go see her when uh, I, in March when the, the women's year is coming up. Um, but ultimately with the awards, I definitely agree with you. We need more women uh, on that voting. And, and I'm personally going to send a message to Luke on it. And I guarantee he's going to be very receptive because he's very, very uh, pro-feminine. Uh, if, if you are um, talking with him about it, another thing I'm going to suggest because it's 2022 and it feels right some of the voters have been voting forever and they have their profile i'm going to give you an example of someone i think this time shouldn't have um the right to vote i'm sorry it's popish because he's benfica head coach i mean benfica wasn't nominated for males but he was nominated, Befica was nominated for female categories. So obviously he voted for Befica. And I'm not going, I'm not saying that Befica didn't, didn't deserve that nominations and didn't even deserve to win. I'm just saying that it's a conflict of interest. And if we want people to get, to look at futsal more seriously, we have to step up our game. And I, re and I've got, I remember Poppies because uh, when I opened his votes, I saw he had his bio completely. I'm thinking that he, he, he wrote that down years and many years ago. Uh, but it's a bit embarrassing, uh, not for him in particular, but 
for the futsal planet that there's one question about um, women, if he's interested in women or not. And I mean, come on, guys, it's 2022. Take that off the year. Please. Yeah, it, it came to me, I think I, I was around 10 years ago, maybe actually a lot more. You know, I used to have a lot more hair on my head. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and and the question came up, it was like, women you're interested in. And I just, you know, I didn't think of deleting certain questions. I just answered it. And I'm like, I think my, my response was all women are beautiful. And that's it. And I wanted to focus more on the sport. Yeah, but that's not, that's not a question to ask on, this is not a modeling. Oh, I agree with you. I'm just saying when it came to me, I'm like, okay, I got these 15, 20 questions. I'm like, I'm going to answer them all. But uh, I'm not going to let the world know that I'm a big fan of Monica Bellucci. You know, oh, oops, I think I just did. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I, I want it to be all about futsal. And, you know, I, I do understand asking the questions because I, I like talking to players and, and coaches, um, not just about tactics and stuff like that. I'm not an expert. I was never a professional player. I don't have, uh, you know, a coaching certification. I went to a FIFA course 10 years ago. Um, but this is not my expertise. I want to hear the expertise mm -hmm. from the actual experts um, that are doing okay. the trade on the court. And for me, I, I like finding out, I'm like, you know, with Zicky, I'm like, you know, right now you have your earphones in. Zicky, what are you listening to right now? Well, who's the artist? You know, what gets you hyped up before the game? And, and he's he's looking at me like, I've never asked these questions. I'm always asked the same thing. And, and Falcao said the same. Yeah. I bring up his family. I'm like, you know, how's, how's your sons doing playing? And he comes up to me, the best compliment I've ever had. He's like, you ask me questions. No one ever asks me. And it's fun to do uh, an interview with you. And and he's been super wonderful to me. This this lowly gringo from Canada, you know, where futsal is <laughs> not, you know, the number one sport out there. But we love it, just like everybody else. Whether you're in Spain, Portugal, Brazil, China, uh, Africa, it doesn't matter. We all love this sport. I think it's the greatest sport on the planet. Um, and I think we definitely need, I don't like using the term diversity because it's so like a cliche, but to not have any female uh, voters out there, that has to change next year. Uh, I guarantee it. I'll, I will. If this does, if if you're not a voter and there's other females who aren't <laughs> voters next year, I'll come on the show. I'll put salt and pepper on my shoe and put it in my mouth. <laughs> but it's it. not just about. It's not just about me. And you, you are. Um, no, but you should the... be a voter. If anything, you should be having my vote. I'll be honest. With you. <laughs> no, I have no, no problem no. admitting that. No, no, I really, no. I really admit that out there. So but, I, I got no but problem. But there's there's a lot of women working towards making futsal an even greater sport, working on creating content about uh, sports you have, S Spanish journalists, uh, Argentinian journalists, and, never, and they are out there, and there's no excuse. I'm sorry. I may, I may sound a bit harsh, but when I, I realized there was 91 voters and all males, I, I remember turning to my wife and said, see? That's why Fran won. No women voting. So this is, <laughs> come on, really. That's why Fran won. This made no sense because there was no women. So <laughs> there was a lot I, of discussion. I, I think it's because he's the Coca Cola of futsal and yeah. people were looking at. Of course, at, I'm, okay, I'm joking. But... No, of course. But you know, people were looking at who won the World Cup, you know, scoring title and all these Golden Ball awards. And, you know, for how he's, you know, he, you see his face, you know who he is, you see the stats, he's up there. Uh, to be honest, when I when I voted, I put one Magnus player and I put the uh, Hot Higo instead. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he had a fantastic year and I thought this guy's well deserving. You know, you're on three World Cup cycles with Brazilian Brazil. captain. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he was fantastic with us. Got 100 goals, 100 goals as a defender. Uh, for Brazil. I mean, yeah. that's not an easy task for any defender, no. let, let alone with the Brazilian. He's a very player. completed player. And very he's so, player. such a great guy. Like, I mean, yeah. everything that he does is just super, you know, he wants to educate people and he's very friendly, down to earth. He doesn't have his nose in the air. And there's some players, I uh, won't mention any names, they've had their nose in the air. And, you know, our response has always been, hey, we're trying to grow the game. Help us out. You know, that's it. But a guy like Rodrigo, you know, if he sees you in, in the hall, he comes up, you know, and, and shakes your hand and then walks away, even if he's in a rush. And those are the players that I think everybody, not just journalists, tend to like just because they're friendly and you want to be friendly to those uh, players in return. So, yeah, obviously. But I, I don't think that's sometimes I agree with you. Really, I do. Um, but sometimes I think we got we get lost and we get uh, off track trying to justify some things and one thing is clear to me on that vote this is not an election 
this isn't supposed to be an election of the um, the nicest guy in futsal. He's the best player in futsal. And it doesn't diminish anyone as a human being to be voted or not to be voted. So that was no, supposed to be... I agree. How yeah. good were you in the last 12 months playing futsal? And I'm sorry, but Ferran wasn't the best. And I, what made me really mad was like, Ferran won one title. He was Spanish champion. He didn't won any of the cups. He lost to Inter Movistar, uh, where P2 was playing. He didn't manage, he, Brazil, didn't manage to go to the, the, the World Cup finals. I, I'm sorry, it made no sense. And it's nothing against Ferran, which I think no. he's a hell of a player. And I don't know him. I'm sure he's a really, really nice guy. But this wasn't a nice guy competition. If, and if it was, I'm pretty sure that Pani would have won as well. Because Pani is a really, really nice person. And him I have interviewed, so I can, I can speak on him. Pani is very, very humble. Really, really humble. And he worked really, really hard to be at this level at this age and uh, he got robbed yeah i i think in in andre caro over from caro futsal he was on the first mm -hmm. episode and he was trying to explain that pani didn't win because he wasn't given the best player of the tournament award at the world cup and they gave it to ricardinho and we all Which was a Ricardo. mistake yeah it, we all it, love it was a good bite yeah. everybody knows that out there um, but they could have made it a goodbye gift, like a career. They they know that it was like they did the Falcao. Like exactly they did. my point. They, they should have done the same thing, especially because they are two legends of the game. So they should have done the exact same thing, not um, giving Ricardinho uh, an award he really didn't deserve. I mean, he was great. He was an a integral different, part of the Portugal team. A different, a different player as the one we were used to to watch but after that injured Ricardinho would never come back to to his old self it's obviously but Ricardinho was super important to to Portugal no one can deny that because not only because what he does on the pitch but especially because of what he does off the pitch we have um a channel here in Portugal is channel 11 is owned by the Portuguese Federation of Football. It's dedicated to football, futsal, and everything. They they do the covers of games. They oh, have right. program. Yes, they have a lot of um, programs about sports. They even have a weekly show about futsal. And they did a documentary. It's called Fifty Eight Days, which is the number of days they have since they they got together to prepare the World Cup until the day they won the World Cup. And um, they talked a lot. The, the players they had commenting was Eric and Afonso and Bebe and João Matos. And Eric and Afonso, the two of the youngest, they were praising Ricardinho, not just because what he we, what we see him doing on the pitch. But I remember Eric saying, so there I was in the practice and we are taking a break, you know, to drink water and everything. And I look, I look at my left side and there it, it is, Ricardinho, running and kicking balls and everything. And I was like, come on, really? The guy is one of the best players ever and still runs like that at 30, 36 years old and after a grave injury and I'm here resting? No, I cannot rest. This, this is making me look bad. And that competitive spirit of Ricardinho was an inspiration for for every for every player that has ever come to the to the Portuguese national team, I remember one of the first times Fabio Cecilio is number five for Portugal is a personal friend of mine. Did it because we met when I was working in Braga and he was playing there, and I remember one of the first times he he was called to to play for Portugal. Uh, he coming coming back from from the games and saying. Ricardinho is insane. And I was like, insane how? He works really, really hard. I went, I went to the to the pitch like 30 minutes after before the practice. So I I thought oh, I was going to warm up a little bit. And the guy was there, like 
one hour before the practice, already practicing. I mean, come on. It's like, okay, he is the best in the world and there's not um, of a chance. He really works hard and we all love to see Ricardinho play. And he did a lot for the Portuguese futsal with his achievements and becoming an, an international symbol, icon of futsal. But he didn't deserve that award. They robbed Pani uh, of that recognition. And see, that's this is the kind of stuff. I know that this, this kind of stories also happen in, in football. But we have to be a little more precise than football because football football is already a widely spread game and we are trying to build that up for futsal to be in the olympics and everything so we need to all of us we need to take this very seriously and be the the most precise and most just we can so when people come and I, there are newcomers every day to futsal they understand the game, they fall in love with the game, and they see this is a fair game with a community of people passionate about the game. That doesn't exclude anyone and doesn't make an internal king of anyone. Couldn't agree with you more. And one of the points you made was we're trying to grow the sport, getting it into the Olympics, and one of those big elements, obviously, is going to be the creation of the Women's World Cup for futsal, not just the world championship with a little rubber stamp from FIFA. We need a women's futsal world cup. First, we have the women's Euro in Portugal in Gondomar, just, I think yes. it's what, East, uh, East of Porto. Yes. Yeah, there we go. So it's like uh, a 10 minutes, 10 minutes drive from Stadio do Dragão, the Oporto stadium. Uh, it's a like super 10 beautiful minutes. stadium. Yeah. I haven't yeah. been to the stadium since the Euro 2004 when Portugal hosted and it was, uh, I think Czech Republic mm -hmm. versus Denmark. But you go up uh, on top of the Dragao and you get the overview of Porto. It's one of the most beautiful and scenic stadiums in the world. And what I'm really interested in is uh, I'm going to fly with my mother because my mother's a, a Portuguese fanatic as well. Mm -hmm. And she's come with me to the World Cup. She's come with me to the last Euro. And to, to be beside your mother when Portugal wins the football European championship uh, mm -hmm. was uh, it erased the memories of, you know, what happened in 2004. But the cool thing is that March 24th, Portugal is playing Turkey in football. And if they get through, they will most likely play Italy on March 29th in Porto. Don't but remember me. <laughs> it's well, I'm I'm ex I'm excited because I got to go. Um, and and growing up in Canada in the Portuguese neighborhood, it was Italian and Portuguese. So the rivalry between Italian fans and Portuguese fans, it was huge. Since we were six years old, we were bred. Here's the flag. You're gonna wave it by the bridge. You're gonna ask the trucks to honk. People think we're crazy when we were young, you know. And um, I wish we had photos from it because it was some of my favorite memories in my childhood. But I've never ever seen Italy versus Portugal uh in in football and this is a big thing to me i've seen them in futsal and it was that game in 2012 we were winning three nil and italy came back and it, it, it shattered my heart and um you know but this one in between those those football matches the only reason i'm bringing that up is because the women's futsal euro is in the same city at the same time with no conflict it's the ultimate week for me this year and uh, <laughs> I, I can't wait to go out there and i know we spoke before we went on air that you might possibly go out there. Uh, and if you do, uh, I mean, we, we got some good Canadian gifts for you out there, but you know. The oh, now I'm, now I'm definitely going. <laughs> yeah, now you're gonna get it. I'll, I'll bring the good stuff out there for you for sure. But if, with the women's game, uh, tell us, you know, what's what's the, the women's situation like for you? Do you think, um, you know, that it's at the level that we're finally ready for a World Cup? that UEFA needs to expand upon it with a Champions League, maybe more teams instead of just the Final Four. What's your thoughts and opinions on growing women's futsal? Well, definitely we, sh we need to create an official competition for women's, for women's teams, like Champions League, but in the female, female side. They had a... There's a, a Spanish uh, tournament uh, that is a yearly tournament, that he's known as the champion, champions of female, but it's not an official UEFA competition. This last December, in the beginning of December, uh, they hosted the tournament, Borella won it. Um, and that time UEFA, I don't know exactly how, but they associated themselves with the tournament. But 
they being associates doesn't make it an official. It's not going to be an official title for Borella. And we need this. We need this. Maybe at the, at the beginning, we don't have as many teams as we have in the male side. This It's obvious we have to be realistic. But if we don't start to value the female futsal, it's never going to grow. It's as simple as that. I think UEFA making a euro is important. I think FIFA needs to do the same thing. I mean, it's urgent. Even though I don't know the the situation that in Asia, the female futsal in Asia, I don't I don't really know the the situation there. Uh, but I think that it's always the same argument. It's it's it, it's easy to understand that if you don't promote the sport, the sport doesn't grow. And this is true for the male part uh, also. I mean, if there wasn't people like you, like me, and like other journalists so passionate about the game that keep promoting it, keep informing people, the sport is not growing. So if we are doing this effort on the male side, why aren't we doing this effort on the female side? Especially for... I, I read a lot of people on... Twitter and some websites and blogs and everything sometimes arguing that um, futsal has been developing into a more predictable game, less uh, magic, less... But have you watched a female's game? Because, yes, some games may be um, uh, a bit less intense and less physical, which is seems obvious to me, but we have some pretty talented women playing futsal. I mean, um, a few few weeks ago, Portugal played against Russia uh, here in Portugal, and uh, it was there was um, a moment of Sara Ferreira. She plays for Benfica. She's a very creative player that went viral on Twitter because she is really good. She's really talented. And like she, so many other female players. So we need to promote this moment because once people start watching, people start to like it because they see, no, there's, there's real talent out there. Obviously, there are better games and worse games, but I, I, I watch male futsal every week, every weekend. I mean, weekend in, weekend out. Portugal's, Spanish, a bit of Russian championship too. And I, I watch pretty boring games too as well in the male side. So it's it's not different on that end. We need to invest more in the um, female futsal. We have some federations already doing that, like the Spanish Federation, the Portuguese Federation. Doing great and job out there in Spain. We need more and Italians. They have a strong championship as well. So we need more countries to follow this lead, but we also need the big responsibles like FIFA and UEFA doing more for female game. We need that because there's a lot of young girls out there that are not going to, to futsal, are not playing futsal because maybe they don't even know what futsal is. They haven't seen, they, they can see the male, the a male playing, but it's not the same thing. The, the level of admiration and the level of identification you have when you see someone like you doing something, it's different. I mean, this is true for everything in life. So obviously it's true for futsal. So we need to promote uh, more women's futsal because it's not for lack of talent. It's for it's what it's lacking. It's opportunities for them to show how talented they are. This is, this is my opinion. Of course... This may sound a little feminist, and it is, and I am a feminist, so, and I'm not shy, and, and I'm not ashamed of it or anything. I don't but think it's, it's a feminist thing. I think it's just an equality of opportunity no, thing. Exactly, shouldn't everyone but, have that equality of opportunity? And I, I really, I invite people to, to watch those for those three games we are going to have on there uh, here in Portugal uh, with four of the top uh, female teams in the world, and you and you'll see. If you see it's uh, Spain Portugal, we've been we had um, two two preparation games against Spain Spain in Spain uh, in December too, I think. And Portugal 
we dropped the first one and we won the second one. And that was an insanely competitive game. It was really good. We had everything. We Every moment of magic and everything you, you look for in a male's game that in the European and you are we are watching now, you will definitely see in the females European. So please watch female futsal too, because you'll you you won't progress. Absolutely. The world championships, I mean, every time we see, you know, Brazil or Spain or Portugal or Russia, I mean they're fantastic. The Ukraine obviously have a great team as well. Yeah. Um people just need to taste the futsal soup. And I've always told them here in Canada and abroad, could you guys imagine Canada invests in a women's futsal team. The U.S. invests in a women's futsal team. Australia comes in. You have three very successful nations in, and, and you know what, I'll even throw England into it. We all know that their FA has not been the most futsal positive one out there, uh, and they deserve all the criticism possible uh, for throwing that futsal program down the toilet, and 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 I don't care who listens to this, they, they better know that. And I know the players, the reps, the coaches, everybody who invested in the grassroots in England uh, was screwed over. Uh, by their FA. Hopefully it's getting better, but I know that Australia is improving. But my point is, imagine countries with great women's football teams, all this female talent, high registrations. Imagine you start futsal. These teams, within a matter of two to three years, will be a top 30 nation in futsal. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, Portugal starting to invest in, in, in the programs here more with the youth players because they're seeing success. If the team wasn't yeah. successful, you don't invest in, in in a loser. That's just how it is. So I've, I've always been promoting heavily, let's invest in women's games, especially in regions where football is high for women because you have a lot of registrations and not everyone is going to be in the top 23 roster for football. And there's a lot of girls in Canada in particular that have played futsal and are now on the women's national football team. And they don't have an opportunity to play futsal because it doesn't exist. So we need to invest. We need to create and give the women the, the equal choice of, of opportunity to come and, and have a career in this sport. And who's to say that you won't have a future, you know, uh, women's, uh, you know, futsal league in all these different countries in the world. Uh, only a select few have them. I think Spain is the, the absolute best in the world. It's fantastic. Brazil is great, too. Um, you know, Portugal's coming up. It, it's It's got to be done worldwide, though, if we're going to get to that level and to have phenomenal journalists like you who just know your stuff inside out not only not only do you get a vote at the futsal awards next year but uh we we're gonna have we're gonna have more conversations as it happens out there now tell us i i always said i'm gonna make this show 30 minutes or less a nice snack and i'm like <laughs> it's never happened because all these yeah. amazing guests i have out here and this honestly this is probably the best show i've done so far and it's because you're making me look good that's how i feel about it <laughs> now if people want to, to get a hold of you, follow you, interview you, read your amazing stuff. And I can vouch, trust me. I mean, there's no one, I, I don't say female journalist, I say futsal journalist. She's one of the best, period. I'm telling you, I'm not saying that because she's on the show now and I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> I've read the stuff, it's great. I need Google Translate to make it happen, but hey, I can still do it okay out there. Where do people read your stuff? Where do they follow you? Where do they, where do they find out what Paula Ferreira Lobo was all about? So um, I'm on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm not that big on social media, <laughs> I must I must say. Um, but I'm I'm trying to keep up with my Twitter account where I develop when I post my my work. Obviously, uh, you can find me in 00.pt. Obviously, I'm managing the team uh, that covers futsal. I'm lucky to we have a small but really strong and talent team. Uh, it's not only my my material, what I wrote, what I write, but there I have a few talented journalists working with me, and we have uh, monthly pieces uh, with Portuguese players, and but not also not only Portuguese players, but we have interview we interview younger players. We actually interviewed Ziki one month before he played the the UEFA Champions League, and he said one of my dreams is to win to win a Champions League. One month later, he not only won, he was actually the elected the best player on the on that tournament. Uh, we do a lot of pieces um, from the past, uh, getting uh, players, former players, to talk about the evolution of from football salon. Uh, from futsal to futsal, uh, how much has the sport um, changed? Because it it has a lot. 
Uh, we do some interviews with people around the globe. We are trying, trying to uh, make more uh, pieces about other championships. We also once a month um, interview one player or one coach or one Portuguese uh, that is playing abroad. We have people from the Luxembourg, we have people uh, from Italy, from France, from Belgium, and it's great because they help us in Portugal to understand um, how futsal is being developed in other countries. And this is important for Portuguese uh, followers as well, because ever since obviously results and championships and titles bring more people to the sport, which is great. And Portugal has uh, experienced a really high interest in futsal. I mean, uh, I work at Zerzara.pt. We are a numbers, <laughs> digital media. We, we live on the numbers and we, we, can, we can vouch for that. There's a lot more interest uh, about futsal now that was five, six years ago. So this is, this is great. And we are trying to do more we wish you could do um more now but i know everyone has 24 hours a day um, we are not we are not different of course um but we, we you can can follow us there uh, there on twitter on facebook and everything i promise i'll try to some not on all the pieces i don't i don't think that's going to be worth i'm sorry but was my time at this point because i i have other projects um but I'll try to translate into English and post on... I don't have a Medium account, but I will create a Medium account <laughs> to translate a, a few few of my works to, to English because I, I really believe, and not because I'm working on them, but others, other, other work from other colleagues of mine, I'll, I'll ask them to, to... They allow me to translate and publish uh, because I, I really believe we are creating interesting content about futsal and not only about Portuguese football, but mostly about Portuguese futsal. But I, I realize that people, we are European champions, world champions. People want to know about Portuguese Portuguese futsal and we are creating this amazing content. So it's important for us to to make it available to, to others, not just to rely on Google Translate that sometimes makes a few mistakes and can can compromise uh, the message we are trying to we are trying to pass, especially because we do a monthly piece, piece with a female player as well. So I'm going to start to translate those. <laughs> I love it. No, you got to so, keep them up. I, I'm, if I'm reading it out there, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, educative, it's informative, it's entertaining, and you get a different perspective uh, when you're reading from that site out there. So you're leading a great team out there. Every single person listening and watching right now, needs to go to the site they need to follow you i'm a i'm a personal believer in that we got a couple of weeks left in the euro show you're going to come back later on in the tournament and join us yeah if you want me i'll i'll have, be happy to this absolutely was great. especially if portugal goes far as i'm expecting them to i'm expecting them to yeah. go all the way to the final i'm expecting them to be champions so <laughs> no pressure <laughs> <laughs> no pre but don't worry i'll i'll uh, as you said on the introduction um i i'm one of the um, for people that do the 524 podcast it's a weekly podcast about futsal and i've already said four or three times that there that i really believe we are going to win the the title again so no pressure guys love it and, and the <laughs> podcast you can get that on spotify and itunes it it is on spotify and itunes but it, we speak in portuguese <laughs> so um, and I gotta work. I gotta you, learn it. So I, I gotta yeah, work it's a great uh, learning, uh, great learning opportunity for those uh, wanting to 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 learn to hear us out <laughs> because we we are uh, for different, really different uh, people. We have a host. He's really funny guy, and he's actually um, his name is Igor, and he's a football and basketball a basketball and foot and football fan that is now starting to enjoy futsal he didn't know much about the game he hadn't really watched futsal in, in a, on a daily on a weekly basis on his life ever since we started this podcast he started to to watch more and more games and a few weeks ago he said you know what i think futsal is now my second favorite 
sport, I mean, basketball, because he's a really NBA hardcore fan. Um, but then futsal is so much more interesting than football. And I was like, yes, yes, because you don't need to exp to wait 30 minutes to watch the ball go near to the goalkeeper. So <laughs> please. I love it. It's so similar to basketball. That's why I think uh, Mark Cuban, you know, wanted to initially invest in in the the professional futsal league in the states, but we we got to see more uh, more stake because it's been nothing but sizzle from the U.S. and we're dying for it because we think in North America, if uh, if futsal becomes a professional sport over here, is going to be serious business, serious opportunities, yeah. and it will change the game forever. I, I'm confident on it. So I mean, if it's a second sport. Hopefully, futsal takes number one like it stole my heart away from football. <laughs> and that's just how I feel about it. So beyond that, everybody, check out Paula Ferreira Lobo, nickname The Wolf. I mean, and that's what <laughs> Yes, last my name. last name really means literally wolf. It's not, an, um, it's not a, a nickname or anything. It's really my family's name. So I love it. We, we got the branding <laughs> set. I, I'm going to make a T-shirt, a couple sweaters for her. We're going to put a little wolf on it out there. Make sure you check her out. Twitter. Uh, do you have Instagram as well? Yes, I don't update it that much, but yes, I do. Paula Hello. F. Lobo. It's the same user as Twitter. Well, you got to check out 00.pt. It is fantastic. Uh, I, I'm telling you right now, it's one of my absolute go-tos out there. So anytime they look at the stats and they see articles uh, read from Canada, I'm the guy. So pretty much uh, in, in a nutshell, I want to see more Canadians and more people internationally checking out your work, checking out your amazing team's work, and the 5 by 4 podcast available on Spotify and other places to get your podcast and with that being said we're done episode five of inside futsal we'll be back tomorrow to talk a little bit about group b action out there and we're going to keep the female trend going with maria pinto joining us out there so we got two portuguese women showing the guys how it's done guys <laughs> step your game up when you come on the show because it's got to be something like what paula's bringing to the table i'm chris fernandez with paula Ferreira lobo thanks for watching have a great night and see you Thank soon you. bye